This is the Clean Energy Show with Brian Stockton and James Whittingham. Hello and welcome to episode 52 of the Clean Energy Show. I'm Brian Stockton. Hey, and I'm James Whittingham. You're listening to a discussion of the week's news in clean energy and green technology. And what a week, Brian. This week we're going to talk about the weather in Texas and how some people say it's the wind turbines. Other people say it's the gas. Some people say different things when they're on Fox News and when they're at home talking to their own people telling the truth. And we're going to have investing news from Warren Buffett. I don't know what that's about. That's your stuff. And EVs yeah. and frigid weather. Lots of, of frigid weather talk this week because not only did it get down to minus 20 in Texas, it got down to minus 1,000 here where we live in Canada. So, Brian, Texas is a big story this week. Yeah, and I got to tell you, I skimmed a couple of articles, and I'm now one of the world's leading <laughs> experts on the electricity grid in Texas. So am I. I, it's, I I'm quite amazed by it. So 10 years ago, they had a cold snap that wasn't as bad. This is considered a one in a hundred year event. I, I heard one in 50. Now they're talking one in a hundred. Uh, and of course, with climate change, you have your one in a hundred year events happening more often. So I don't know if this is a breakup of the polar uh, vortex that has been affecting us that's going to affect Texas more often. Uh, and God help them if it does, because they have to deal with hurricanes. At least, Brian, we don't have to deal with hurricanes, do we? No, we do get uh, tornadoes, though. So Not you know. too many. It's not like we're dodging them every day. But it, <laughs> there's a certain amount. I think um, uh, a great deal of people in Texas don't have insulated homes, because why would you? You want to insulate against... Yeah. Uh, uh, the power grid is uh, set up to uh, deal with minus 40, or plus 42, not minus 42, not minus 20. So the, they're, the power grid is set up for peak demand for air conditioning on hot days, right? Yeah. And... Uh, a lot of it is, uh, a lot of the heating comes from electricity, so when the electricity comes out, you're screwed. But you do need electricity for heating, even if you have natural gas. A lot of people forget. Uh, the people are saying, well, we, sh we can't use electricity off of solar and wind if, if it's, if it's going to go out. Well, you can't have uh, gas heating either, unless it's a boiler. Yeah, no, absolutely. Our furnaces need uh, electrical fans to operate. So, um, you know, when you experienced that, you had that big, what was it, 11-hour power outage? 11 hours, but they've been out for 24 hours, and they've had rolling blackouts in Texas. And I really feel bad for them um, because I, I had heat in my house. I mean, I was warm in my house when my power went out. It even It was only like, it was warmer here when my power went out. It was like minus five or something. And... Um, have a well-insulated house for the Canadian prairies, and it worked well. Uh, but in Texas, they're they're going to their cars to warm up. They're using what little hot water they can get. And uh, I really, I mean, that's it's horrible. It's it's probably more painful than a hurricane, uh, uh, what they're going through down there. Yeah, and it's sad because, of course, um, everything in this day and age becomes a clickbaity oppositional kind of argument. So on the one hand, uh, you've got people blaming the wind turbines, and then uh, on the other hand, you have reality, which is um, it's a mostly natural gas and coal-powered mix. I have a chart in front of me. So sure. um, Texas is 46%, this is the electrical grid, 46% natural gas, 23% wind, 18% coal, 11% nuclear, and just 2% solar. So their wind mix is actually quite large at 23%. And they have had freezing rain, I guess. I wasn't quite clear on this, like why some of their wind turbines have stopped working. But I guess freezing rain, is. do you know any more about that? Uh, part of it is lubricants. The lubricants aren't rated for minus whatever, and part of it is icing. But of course, wind turbines work in cold weather. Most of the uh, wind turbines in the world are, you know, they're in Nordic seas where it's splashing around in moist air. And uh, we have wind turbines in Saskatchewan here. Uh, not as many as we should, but they do function. Uh, what I did learn, Brian, and this is very interesting to me, is that they only work until minus 30. I had no idea that wind turbines only work to minus 30. I don't know why that is. I don't know if there's an alternative for that or if, if, if it's worth finding uh, a solution to why they only work to minus 30. Uh, I have a, a feeling that they're just not rated. Now, 10 years ago in Texas, they did have problems uh, with cold weather, and they did have reports that come out that said you should winterize your turbines and your natural gas system and your electrical grid. Did they do it? 
Eh, a little bit, but not 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 enough. I mean, it, it's 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 hard to prepare for something that you don't know is going to happen. Like who who would have thunk minus twenty in Dallas the other day or something like that? I mean, that's Celsius, by the way. So no, that's quite surprising. They expected for a peak uh, winter event to have sixteen percent from wind and thirty percent from natural gas. So there's twice as much natural gas involved, and it's mainly the natural gas that's not working. Um, and there's different reasons for it, but I have a clip here from uh, uh, Mark Hislop's sh- um, YouTube channel. I'm just going to get to that. He has uh, been talking to a professor, Joshua Rhodes, at the University of Texas in Austin. And I'll just play you a bit of uh, Mark's interview with him. Yeah, so we've we've got kind of a, a cascading failures in, in multiple different grids like um just back up a little bit of backup you know texas is a it's a summer peaking system like we size our things for hot summer afternoons when it's 42 degrees outside and we're all trying to you know cool our houses down gas wells out in west texas are getting so cold they're freezing and so we don't have supply going into the system and we've got record supply trying to go out of the system they said yesterday that about a third of our thermal fleet is offline so again, that was Professor Joshua Rhodes, the University of Texas at Austin, and I took that from Mark Hislop's Energy Media YouTube channel, which I recommend, as well as his podcast, and he's on Twitter. Uh, good person to follow. He's a Canadian journalist who writes about the energy industry. Um, Brian, I don't know what else you have to say about that, other than I'm, I'm just really surprised at how this is not working and how it's uh, how it's been blamed on um, on wind. Yeah, no, especially when when wind is is only 20, 23% of the grid. But that thing you said about lubricants makes a lot of sense because of course we use different oil in our cars in our gas burning cars. That's right. You know, you use a 5W30 oil in Canada because you need that for the cold whereas, you know, if you're down south you don't have to worry about that. So yeah, different uh, lubricants that that explanation makes a lot of sense to me. But the other thing I learned as I became one of the world's leading experts on the power grid in Texas was that uh, they have a unique grid there that's actually closed off yes. from the rest of the grid in America. They uh, set up a long time ago to be a completely independent state in terms of their power grid. And it was to avoid some federal regulations that were brought in like, you know, 50 or 100 years ago or something. So in order to avoid the federal regulations, they made a power grid that is state only. So most states and, you know, certainly our provinces here in Canada, we do have separate grids for each province, but they still talk to each other. So we can still uh, supply power to our neighboring province and they can supply it to us. And in fact, Manitoba, they supply a lot of power to the northern United States. So it goes across borders. But uh, in Texas, they don't have that. So that is also another reason why they've had this grid failure is that they don't have that ability to import power from uh, neighboring states. And that, of course, Texas is a huge bloody mistake. And you can't do that, especially now in the time of renewables. And you could say what you want about renewables. We're going to get a lot of hate comments. I know that. Well, screw you. Screw you, haters. I never <laughs> liked you. You don't know what you're talking about. And look at the facts. You know, the governor of Texas was on, uh, I saw some, a journalist, a national journalist in the States show the different ways that the governor of Texas is talking about it. On Fox News, he blames the wind turbines. <laughs> On his own, um, and I've been reading a lot of Texas papers here to see what's really going on. That's all you have to do, people. Pick up a freaking newspaper. And I know you don't trust it if it doesn't agree with you, if facts don't agree with you. But pick up a Texas newspaper. You can see what's actually going on. You see what the guy's uh, saying in Texas. And he's, of course, blaming the natural gas. And and uh, natural gas is finicky. I don't know. Do, they, do you know if they... Um, Well, for one thing, our natural gas uh, lines are like four feet underground so they don't freeze because that's kind of where the frost line is. That doesn't freeze at four feet down, right? Something like that. Yeah. Well, our system is winterized. Like it has to be built to withstand minus 40. So it is. Yeah. And they have plenty of reserve as well. Um, Thank goodness, because when it does, you know, suddenly go from uh, minus two to minus 42 Celsius, you you don't want to be without heat. You know, Texas, Brian, has the population basically of Canada. And so if you think about our whole country uh, without power and rolling blackouts in very cold conditions and dealing with snow, like they've never had a wind chill warning ever in history. They've had a wind chill <laughs> warning. Hello, people in Texas. Welcome to uh, Canada weather. Uh, hopefully you won't have to deal with that anymore. 
Um, you know, like, uh, who knows? It's just, uh, j- just because, you know, it's a one in a hundred year event doesn't mean it's global warming that's caused this. But if it starts happening on a regular basis, um, that means something weird is going on with the climate, climate weirding, as they say, and the polar vortex is, uh, um, yeah. So it's, it's happening in other places. And what's making us very cold is, has sort of dipped down to Texas. Okay, so it's gone all the Texas is directly below us, by the way. Hello down there in Texas. If you look up, you can see us uh, here in Saskatchewan. Uh, officials of Mississippi said they have not had uh, ever had heavy duty plows for their trucks to clear highways. So they can't clear they can't clear the snow off their highways. Uh, the, the state rarely needs them. And I don't blame you. I mean, it's hard to spend money on something that might happen once every hundred years. Right. I, I yeah. put your tax dollars somewhere else. I mean. Uh, and just uh, grit your teeth through it. But this is pretty painful stuff. Uh, cars were craning out of control and residents were slipping on ice and they had little practice navigating. I, uh, uh, I, I, I know when I see ice, Brian, I, I slow down and get cautious, especially as I'm top heavy now. I'm a lot top heavier than I used to be. Yeah, and I have, you know, factory studded winter tires on my car. That's the first time I bought those. It's actually kind of a new thing. Uh, studs that are put on at the factory, they're often just put on at the, the tire shop. So um, I don't know, with our climate changing slightly here, like we got rain in January, which also happened a few years ago. This is a thing that never used to happen. Um, our roads are a lot icier, it seems, in the winter. So a thing like a studded tire, I actually think is fairly important now. It really helps on those super icy uh, conditions. Um, but yes, uh, studded tires aren't even illegal everywhere. In southern Ontario, it's actually illegal to have uh, studded tires. Because of what it does to the asphalt or what? Yeah, although I th- I think that's more based on the way studs were made 50 years ago. So, um, but it's it's also it's generally warm enough that you, you don't need it. You know, it's it, it just I bet that Texas had more snow or almost as much snow as we had last year, and the year before that, and the year before that, we've had a stretch that we have a bit more snow this year, uh, which has allowed cross country skiing. But uh, our weather has has. Um, sort of uh, shuffled from minus 30 Celsius, and now next week it'll be plus, it'll be melting. So there's no sweet spot for having fun in the winter or even going for a walk, because once it gets melty, then you start dealing with ice. And I slipped on the ice already this year. It was not pleasant. My my aging body is not falling well, Brian. <laughs> it's not. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I went down once too, and uh, it was not pleasant. I actually watched a YouTube video about cycling in Finland. Um, I don't have the name of it in front of me, but that's another thing I think we don't think enough about around here. Like we obviously have money for snow clearing and snow plowing, but I, I don't know. It it could probably be better spent. This uh, city in Finland, you know, they have all of these purpose-built bike lanes for winter cycling, but they don't scrape them down to the cement. They actually, it's sort of like more like grooming. They groom a layer of packed snow, which is kind of a better grip for most uh, bicycles. Is it? Around here, it's kind of haphazard. Sometimes we shovel down to the cement, sometimes we don't. And, uh, you know, if you do try to shovel down to the cement, you often get this patchy black ice, which is more dangerous. So that made a lot of sense to me when I, I saw this about, you know, cycling in Finland that, you know, we really should do more grooming than clearing around here. If we had a consistent layer of hard packed snow, that would be probably better than what we have now. Interesting. How are you finding the tires? Yeah, the tires on the car have been great. I, I would would ha- really hesitate to go with anything other than uh, studded tires at this point. It's it, We just have too much ice on the roads. Well, I'm going with uh, nearly bald, all-weather, all-season <laughs> tires. That's what I'm going with. Good luck. <laughs> I do have the luxury of living on a Category 2 street, which they plow on a regular basis. I also have the luxury of a uh, pandemic, so I don't go anywhere. And also the luxury of, you know, electric cars are heavier. Uh, you'll see a lot of people putting sandbags in their pickup trucks uh, for winter. They don't have to do that with electric. It's heavy, heavy, he- heavy yeah. as it is. So, Brian, according to the Canadian government, there are cold weather packages on wind turbines installed in Canada uh, most of the time, maybe not in uh, on the West Coast where it's a bit warmer. But um, apparently they saved money by not putting the cold weather packages on wind turbines uh, because uh, they figured they only, they'd only need it one in 50 years. And, uh, well, here we are. Now, if their grid becomes, uh, they have a lot of wind in Texas, but if it comes, becomes even more 
uh, dependent on wind, then uh, what are they going to do? Yeah, good question. I, I don't know. Okay, so the Canadian government says that uh, uh, they expect uh, to frequently operate in freezing temperatures with moisture to keep the blades turning. They, they freeze the ice off the blades. And uh, I wouldn't want to be around a wind turbine with ice flying off of it. <laughs> and keep the power going in temperatures as low as minus 30. Uh, conditions can vary across Canada, with some places experiencing much worse winter weather than others. Hello, that's us. And turbine operators spend these measures uh, tailor fit for their installation. I would like to talk to a wind person. If you're a wind person, give me a call. Uh, give me a DM. I want to know um, if it's possible because, you know, uh, in our far north, they're going to need some power and wind would be a good way to get it up there. Brian, I do know uh, that uh, solar works in mine is anything because we have solar panels on our roof. Now, yours are, are kind of flat, so they get snow and they stay that way for a long time. Mine's fortunately more at an angle and they all face south. And I had melting the other day at minus 25 Mine is yeah. 25 because the wind was calm in mid-February. I might have believed it in late March, you know, if it, if it got that cold, and it does sometimes, melting. So what happens at 1 o'clock at our solar noon here, when the sun is the highest in the sky and there's no wind, I assume the wind is important because it only happens when there's no wind and the, the, so the radiant heat can build up on the roof. And I had melting. So I had a, a three panels covered and now they're not covered anymore because it melted. My sun saw it dripping off the roof. I just cannot believe. The sun is a very powerful thing, people. If you have no idea what it is, look it up. It's a big, hot thing in the sky. No, and as we discussed earlier, uh, Texas only has 2% of their grid is solar. So if they increase that mix, maybe they'd be doing a bit better now. Yes, and I I read that uh, solar came back online. It was offline, too. Some of it is just the grid itself, just the electrical switching and stuff, and the transformers and the down thingies and the upswingies, and the, they're just not working in the cold weather, too. So, uh, yeah, increase that solar. I don't know why they don't have more solar in Texas, especially with the price declining. We're going to have more on that later in the show. That wraps us up for the YouTube portion of our show. Uh, remember to subscribe to our YouTube channel where we are posting videos every week. I've got a video up there that I made last week, Brian, of uh, how electric cars work in minus 40 degree weather. I had a quick little explainer, something that fit on Twitter. And it's up there if you want to have a look at it. I'm James Whittingham. We'll be right back. The Clean Energy Show wants to hear from you. Contact us on Twitter, Clean Energy Pod, by email, cleanenergyshow at gmail.com, by voicemail, speakpipe.com slash cleanenergyshow. And don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Well, Brian, how are you? It looks like we're we're through the extreme cold that we've had in Saskatchewan, and things are looking brighter. If I could only get a vaccine in my arm. <laughs> For the first time ever, one of the blinds on our front windows actually froze to the window. There was so much ice buildup on the window. And I finally got it unstuck yesterday because it got slightly warmer. And the inch, it was like almost an inch of ice on the front window inside, on the inside yes. of the front window of our house, maybe two centimeters of, of pure uh, ice that, you know, the blind had stuck to at one point. I have a similar story. I had, uh, I've got a window, a small window in our bathroom that hasn't been upgraded to a new one. And most of our windows have been upgraded. And this one has a little crack in it. And uh, <laughs> when it's minus 40 or 30, it gets ice build up like that. But the thing is, when it warmed up to minus 25, half that ice melted. Because you know it got it didn't the heat in the house could compete with the heat the cold outside and sort of so then water started dripping down you have to deal with cleaning that up um, yeah I've got to get that replaced now here's my other story about the cold snap so uh, have you been using drive throughs you know like drive through restaurants in the pandemic uh, I send my boy my teenage boy yeah. <laughs> Well, this is the thing I noticed in the drive throughs which I don't typically use, but it's a pandemic, so I've been actually using drive throughs quite frequently, coffee, snacks, lunch, whatever. Um, in this cold snap that's gone on so long, there is stalagmites 
growing in the paths that the cars drive. So the cars drive around the drive through it's minus 35. There's often little drips of condensation that come out of the tailpipes of these cars. And as they sit there, sometimes for a couple of minutes before moving forward, all this water drips out. And so there's these stalagmites all over all of the drive throughs that have been building up uh, to the point where it's actually getting kind of dangerous. I keep expecting my car to kind of slip off one of these oh. uh, stalagmites and maybe move to the side or something. Thing. But I don't know. I had never noticed that phenomenon before, and it's only going to happen if you have such an extended streak of uh, super cold weather and, you know, people still drive uh, gas-burning cars. How is your car working in the cold weather? Do you have any updates on that? I do have a couple of updates, yeah. In the extreme cold, the minus 35, it was sometimes struggling a bit to keep the cabin warm. It, it feels like it's maybe a sensor issue or something. Like once the car gets super cold, it maybe gets a little bit confused about things. Really? Um, and I noticed some condensation and frost on the pillar cameras. There's cameras in each of the door pillars. And one day I noticed it was kind of frosted over with condensation. And the next day it was sort of like had turned into sparkly, <laughs> sparkly frost inside. Um, you know, the, they were still able to, to see with the cameras. But uh, yeah, it, it's it, it, the car struggles a bit when it's minus 35. So just to remind everyone, you have a Tesla Model 3. Uh, probably manufactured exactly a year ago, right? I mean, you got it about yeah, like, about that yeah. in March or something, and um, that's a standard range, what standard range, long range, standard range plus, standard yeah. range plus, and uh, yeah, it doesn't have the heated steering wheel or the um, the um, the heat pump to the heat the car charge port. Um, I'm finding the Leaf quite good for cold weather. Like uh, it, it does, it can take a bit longer if it's not preheated. But once it gets there, baby, it's it's warm, and uh, you, you are using a lot of electricity to uh, to keep it that warm. But you know, small city, um, I'm doing okay with that. Uh, <laughs> my uh, my son, uh, there was one day I have to tell you the story because there was one day where I had the buses weren't running. I had to drive my daughter to school and my son to um, high school, pick him up at high school, take him home from high school, pick up my daughter. And I said, well, you know what? I don't think I'm going to have the range uh, to do that or the time to charge it because my, my car only charges at 3.3 uh, 3 kilowatts uh, in the driveway. Some go up to 11, by the way. Uh, others are around 7. Uh, so you can charge twice as fast in your driveway. But I have a, a very old Leaf. It's, it's 2013. The battery's not 100%. And uh, it's it's probably got about 83% capacity or something. So think about it as a, like a, a fifth of what new cars are. And uh, anyway, so I, I said, well, can you stay for lunch? Because uh, some people stay for lunch. So I left my son stay for lunch, and I charged the car up at home all day. I It was just a precaution, and uh, I didn't want to deal with any... Uh, any range anxiety or anything. And uh, my, my daughter's school, by the way, is on the way the other end of town. Like she's in some French immersion and it's, it's not next door. Um, so uh, the, 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 the time I do this, Brian, he has a teacher come up to him and says, uh, I follow your dad on Twitter. He really likes his electric car. <laughs> And then my, my son says, well, it doesn't always have range, which is this cold. I had to get dropped off today. The one day that I, I didn't take the chance, but then it would never even happen. The conversation wouldn't have happened if I didn't do that. So if you're listening, teach. Uh, yeah, electric cars are wonderful in winter, and uh, uh, I really like them. I prefer them, and uh, my wife prefers them, too. When she goes and does a little trip somewhere, uh, she takes the, the, the car that heats up quickly. No, that's a great video you posted, uh, you know, condensing your two-hour presentation into two minutes. <laughs> so that's on Twitter, and I don't know if that one's on the YouTube channel, but it I is, thought that yeah. was a really great, succinct explanation of, of why they're better, with the possible exception of range, but of course, modern cars are, uh, you know, less of an issue. There's a solution to the range issue. It just means that people in Canada have to buy a bigger battery, and uh, but their experience will be the same as anybody else. And uh, I also think that Tesla and some other people are maybe a little behind in how they precondition their battery, how they maybe insulate their battery. There might be some issues that'll get ironed out once electric cars go mainstream at the end yeah, of the decade. Yeah, and that was the other thing I would mention about uh, the Tesla is that even though I was driving it around one day, it was like minus 35 and windy. <laughs> and it had warmed up at one point, but then the snowflake icon 
appeared again. Like I was normally when you drive it around, it, it gets warm and it stays warm. You only get that snowflake if it's been sitting. But even though I was driving around, the little snowflake appeared because it was, you know, minus 35 and windy. So uh, again, yeah, probably something to do with the, the insulation of the battery pack could be a little better. I, you know, I'd like to know more about that because I, I've never not had my leaf battery get warmer as I drive. And uh, especially if you, hmm. I mean, if you go on the ring road or the, the freeway or, or go at highway speeds, then it gets, my battery gets warm very quickly and I get more regeneration of the brakes back. Um, the, in the leaf, you have little dots to tell you how much uh, leaf uh, electric gener- regeneration you have because the battery is so cold. Yeah. Well, that increases at the more you drive. If you're driving for a half hour and you do a little bit on the freeway, uh, that battery warms up and I've never seen it go down. Although... I mean, you know, you're you were. I wasn't driving the same day you were, so it's hard to say. But I would like to know more about that. I I know it's it, this is like the Texas situation because do the car companies uh, go to this extra effort uh, for the few thousand people on the Canadian prairies? Because <laughs> even Norway is doing fine with the way things are. Because in Oslo, you have a, an ocean moderating the temperature, even though part of Norway does cross the Arctic Circle. So. Yeah, and, you know, typically my battery does seem to get warmer. It's just that that one day it was, yeah, crazy cold and crazy windy, and uh, I realized it wasn't gaining like it normally does. So last week, Brian, we had um, a little bit of a discussion about our listener John's leaf problem. He had a Nissan Leaf from 16 or 17 model year, and uh, he's using it actually for a car share program, I think, in Regina. And uh, it sat for three days in like minus 35-ish temperatures, and um, it didn't start. And uh, a lot of problems with electric cars, if they have a problem, it's with the, actually the little 12-volt battery because the, the thing doesn't get used enough. And what I've learned is that in uh, it doesn't get to dis- ever get discharged enough in order to get a big b- blast of electricity into it. And that sort Mm -hmm. of conditions those kinds of batteries. Now, you can go out and buy a lithium battery. And uh, Elon Musk has said he's going to put only lithium 12-volt batteries in Teslas, and they will last the life of the car. So that problem is solved in the future for anyone buying a Tesla. Boom. Problem solved. But for John, um, I would recommend for people to check their battery. And you can do this with a voltmeter, or you can take it to a battery shop, and they'll just put a little thing on it in the fall. Uh, After it's... Uh, say three years old, maybe start checking it uh, every fall just to make sure it's, you know, I you can look it up on the internet. I think it should say uh, around 12.6 to 13.2 when it's uh, been recently charged and used and, and not turned on. And, uh, and if it's below that, then you start to know that your, your battery's starting to go on. And maybe they can give it a boost by just... Uh, Charging. Anyway, what happened to John is uh, his battery heater on his Leaf start, stopped working because the 12 volt, for some reason, it stopped charging and it stopped working. It's not that it used the 12 volt, it's maybe as it ran the computer or the it, something happened that it didn't work. And uh, so he had a frozen uh, lithium battery, which you don't want to have uh, if you can help it. And uh, my battery heater kicks on at minus 20, so lithium batteries by my standard on my car, says they're not uh, functional below my S20 without the heater. So he had no option but to tow it somewhere warm. I wonder, John, if you're listening, if it might have worked. If it was me, I probably would have tried to put, because I've got uh, my camper, I've got those little portable space heaters like you have at the cottage, you know, that you plug in. Mm -hmm. Uh, I might have put one of those in my car and just heated up the car uh, for like, 10 hours until the, it had an effect on the battery pack, which is just below the, the floor. Um, if I was really desperate, I might have put it underneath the car and sort of covered it in with a tarp or something um, yeah. just to warm it up. Uh, but that was a – poor John had a, a problem with his leaf uh, because he wasn't using it. I guess the moral of the story is, and this is something I've started doing when it's that cold, I just started every day. No, you're not really starting anything, but you're turning on the – the main battery to top up the, the 12 volt and just keeping it in operation. You would do that with a gas car. You wouldn't leave a gas car sitting for a week. Uh, you would want to, because the battery there would, you know, the more you start it, the more uh, power goes back into that 12 volt battery. And hopefully, Brian, someday yeah. they'll get rid of 12 volt batteries. They'll have a different architecture, right? 
No, and for even for Teslas, yeah, you got to replace that every three to five years, and yeah, it is a source of problems for uh, Tesla owners. Usually, the first problem that most Tesla owners have is uh, suddenly, you know, the twelve volt gets weak after you know three, four, or five years. But it sounds like. So John, he towed it to a warm garage. It sat in the warm garage, and then it was fine. Is that right? That's correct. Yep. Just took a charge from then on, and you know he's going to put a trickle charger on the battery. I think he should replace the battery, but I don't blame him for not spending money. I don't like spending money. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, a, a new battery uh, could be in order, and it, it, it's let's face it, John, it's the battery. It's probably the battery, <laughs> so you should replace it if you can. They're not. The most expensive thing in the world, and you'll you certainly don't want to have problems with it. You don't certainly you never want to be in that situation. So I, I thought that was interesting, Brian. The uh, SpaceX fairing did not land on the mothership. Yeah the 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 first stage booster. Yeah they they missed the landing. Can you explain what that was? They were launching Starlink satellites, and then usually the booster comes back. It had done it how many times successfully? Well, they've had 24 successful landings in a row, and it was about a year ago was the last time that they, they missed a successful landing. So, um, you know, their record is is pretty good, and hopefully this gives them the data to kind of figure out. They haven't said really what the problem was, but if you watch the video, you could see the a little bit of the flare. They always have a video of the landing pad, which is on a floating platform in the ocean, and you could catch a glimpse of the engines. It's like you see this flare. You see light first. It was at nighttime. Mm-hmm. So you always see a bit of light first and uh, before it lands. And this time we just saw the light and then nothing. It just landed somewhere in the ocean. All right, we have a clip. And we are attempting to land on, of course, I still love you. For the sixth time for this booster. And it does look like we did not land our booster on. Of course, I still love you tonight. Okay. I was being funny there. Very nice. <laughs> yeah. Something like that. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, it's too bad. Um, I, I wonder if they have a... You know, if they cannot maybe push it that far with multiple repeat landings, do they have a, a life cycle on them? Do you know anything about that? Well, it sounded like this one, uh, this was, I think, the fifth use for this one. But I think they've had them up to nine uses. They've had boosters that have done up to nine. So, you know, who knows what the issue is. But, you know, it, it's pretty reliable. It's just once you've got people on them, I mean, the the people aren't normally on the booster, so it's not a huge problem. But once they have Starship and they've they've blown up two of them trying to land them, and those are obviously at some point going to have uh, people on them. Well, actually, I don't know that. I, you know, often the, the people are on a capsule that, that comes down separately. Yeah. So maybe I don't know what I'm talking about. Yeah, you about. don't. Um, unless... Unless they plan on doing that, which should be scary. But uh, right now, the well, they've, the capsules come down. They've all. talked about, you know, intercontinental travel with these kind of spaceships where you would take off in yeah. New York and land in London. Yeah. Uh, so obviously those would be people's ships, but, uh, you know, we're a ways away from that. Brian, it's time for our brand new segment, What Do You Think? What do you think? Brian, Elon Musk was on Joe Rogan. What do you think? I've listened to about the first hour, but it's really long, so I, I haven't had time to listen to it all. I, I normally listen to podcasts when I'm walking, uh, but I'm not walking anywhere because it's been minus 35. Really? When I used to walk to work, I would still walk to work when it was minus 35. Now I just walk for uh, exercise, and I find it's hard to uh, get the motivation up uh, when it's, it, you know, it's just when it's not essential, uh, I'm not Your walking. motivation has a limit. It's got a line, a line in yeah. the snow, as it were. Tesla has launched a test run by reducing its supercharger prices by 50% on certain days in Norway to uh, alleviate peak um overuse your your thoughts what do you think yeah well that's the nice thing about a network like tesla's where you can control everything on the internet and and through the software is that yeah you can make adjustments to try and uh yeah alleviate uh crowding problems which does happen on certain you know peak travel days so yeah there's there's ways with software you can tweak this stuff and and make it better so you wanted to talk about warren buffett what is warren buffett up to warren buffett everyone has was speculating a few weeks ago that he had perhaps 
purchased a stake in Tesla because he had some kind of a filing that said that there was a certain amount of money that um, they weren't yet disclosing what it was invested in. And so the speculation was maybe it was Tesla, which is a company that he's so far avoided. And he's not really a technology guy, so that kind of makes sense. That's really kind of outside of his realm of of what he invests in, but it was kind of surprising what was finally revealed as uh, the investment. This is $4.1 billion that Warren Buffett invested, and it turns out it was in Chevron, uh, a massive oil company. Uh, (laughs) So this was a big surprise, and uh, certainly a surprise to me. He's a Uh, clearly one of the great investors, so presumably uh, he knows what he's talking about. So maybe as money is fleeing fossil fuels, he uh, appears to have seen some kind of an opportunity there. Now, he's also invested in Suncor, which owns uh, uh, PetroCanada in Canada, the gas station chain that used to be, uh, was set up by the federal government. And uh, that's also just put in superchargers, like fat level three chargers coast to coast um, when he was doing that. And they have a stake in the oil sand. So I don't know what Warren Buffett is up. I mean, he 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 invested in uh, BYD before it was cool back in like 2008. He was the, the first person to see. So I guess he doesn't care where his money comes from. It's all a game to him. No, exactly. And this is the odd thing, I guess, about this scale of investing, because it would certainly never occur to me to put uh, money into something that, uh, you know, like, say, a tobacco company even. it's. But there are people that still invest in tobacco companies, and they're, you know, some of them even making money at it. But uh, he clearly doesn't have that type of a uh, mindset when it comes to his investing. Okay, well, Tesla is down $26 on the day, 3.26%, sitting at $770 US for your updated last second state-of-the-art stock ticker here on the Clean Energy Show. Brian, a big story that I think this week was the Chevrolet Bolt uh, refresh. That is a basically the first low-priced over 200-mile range car came out four years ago. They've done a major refresh on it, making it... Actually, they've gone around. I like this. They actually went around. Uh, and by the way, the Bolt has a high um, user likability. Like, they, the, pe- the satisfaction rate is quite high. But they still went around to people and said, hey, what can we do better? And, of course, the seats, I, I confirmed myself. I got a fat ass, and my those seats are not comfortable. They're very... It, basically, they got a lot about the car right, except for the seats. And uh, But one of the things they didn't get right was um, the charging speed. It is quite low. It's 50 kilowatts for when you're on the highway, which is not fast, um, and certainly behind standards. And unfortunately, the refresh hasn't improved that. Maybe they will. But they've also come out with a Chevrolet... Uh, EUV, the Bolt EUV, which is just a taller car. It has a tiny bit more ground clearance. The wheels are not bigger. They don't look bigger in what the pictures I've seen. Um, But it's got more of a boxy SUV styling. I actually like the styling a lot better. People said that the Bolt styling has been improved, but I'm not crazy about it. Um, But it's only, the thing is, it's only $2,000 more to get the EUV. I mean, how could you How would you say no to that? Uh, But the big story here, Brian, is $5,500 base level price reduction. So they've come out with a refresh and knocked half of $10,000 off of it. That is pretty damn significant. And they're saying $5,000 across all trim levels. Um, It's it's $32,000, including destination. So if that was Canadian terms, um, it would be $30,000 because there's always $2,000 for a destination in Canada, pretty much. Uh, that's cheap, and that's uh, that's significant for um, basically how far it goes. And you, you do lose about 15 kilometers or 9 miles range on the EUV uh, because it's heavier and less aerodynamic and all that. Um, but there's a lot of states that, because they're going to... Uh, refresh the uh the seven grand um um rebate in the states for electric vehicles they're going to put that on another four hundred thousand for tesla and for gm that it'll only be twenty five thousand dollars in a lot of states and even cheaper than that how could you not buy an electric car especially if uh if it's your second car and you're not going on highway trips i am disappointed i mean i'm i'm seriously like look i have to figure out a car 
a year from now, I have to buy a new car. We have to unload our leased uh, Prius, which has been in two accidents, and uh, get, get it out of our system here and, and forget it ever happened. Because <laughs> I'd want to sell it on the open market with, I could buy it. Normally, we would buy it outright and just keep it for a while, but I don't know what to buy. I'm still, I, I've got a year left and I've got to buy something. Yeah, so it is a very similar car to what it was last year, but this, uh, yeah, price reduction on the starting price, that's a big deal. Um, the Bolt is, uh, at least in the last year, it was the top selling electric car aside from Tesla. And uh, there are deep discounts uh, all year, really, but especially now because the new models are coming out and the starting price is lower. So if you want a deal on a current Bolt, there are uh, good bargains to be had in Canada and in the U.S., uh, but and the new one's not coming till summer, so we do have to wait a bit for this. But it's it's certainly a compelling option. It, 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 this is the price drop we keep yeah. expecting yeah. and waiting for. So hopefully next it's you know the Hyundai Kona, maybe that drops by five grand. Uh, the Kia Niro EV, hopefully that drops by five grand. Uh, this the 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 price drops are starting to happen. People, Brian Stockton, are going to buy this damn vehicle in uh, large quantities. Another thing about the Chevy Bolt is that it's available, that you can go to your Chevy dealership, which has a large, of course, you know, uh, network of dealerships across North America and other places, uh, and get one. You can't do that with a Nissan Leaf in Regina. You can't do that with the Kona, Right. No, and where we are, I mean, they may still try and convince you to buy a gas car oh, yeah, if you will. go to Chev to, to buy a Bolt, but it is it is actually available. That is true. There, there's a decent quantity. It's not Tesla-like quantities, but they're making a decent quantity. But you quantity can get one. You might vehicles. have to wait for a month or two, but you can... And you might even find one on the lot. Who knows? Um, I haven't been following that. Our friends over at our Saskatchewan EV associations um, have been, and there's an actual webpage which we keep track of all those things. They keep track of all those things, and that's very nice. Brian, there's a very interesting thing that they've done with this. Not only is it cheap, not only is, is it $5,500 cheaper, they will come to your house and install charging, which is... I don't know what the fine print is in that. I don't know if they have limits because some people will need a new sub panel on their uh, electrical box and things like that. Uh, I did, um, but it's pretty sweet. It's it's good. There's it's taken out one of the major sort of uh, you know barriers that uh, to just walking in and buying a car. And we don't want people in Canada, especially to be charging at 110 volts because that will a lot of that will go to your battery heater and it won't even charge your car and it won't heat your car. Uh, you'll lose battery range when it's heating, preheating for you instead of coming off the grid at 240. So uh, they will do that. And uh, this, this is fantastic. What they have is a cable that comes with the car that has two ends on it, one to go in 110 volts and one to go in 240. So it's you don't have to buy a charger. So th that makes the car even cheaper. I mean, if you you could take four thousand dollars off, two thousand for the installation. No, three thousand dollars off. Say two thousand for the installation of an electrical outlet, and thousand uh, dollars for a charger. If you wanted to buy a nice charger, I didn't, uh, not yet. Anyway, uh, I bought a cheap one. Uh, I'm ashamed to say, off of Amazon. I think that's fantastic. Yeah, so you just need the two hundred and forty forty volt plug, but uh, it sounds like they will do that for you. That's that's smart uh, smart marketing for them. I think people, you know, there there are a lot of people out there who, um, a want a bigger vehicle. The uh, crossover um, format is the most popular format in North America. People aren't buying hatchbacks so much anymore, um, so that's going to be appealing. And the fact that you can get them is going to be appealing. And the fact that they do all this for you at a, a price. I mean, the cost of operation. If you if you compare. These vehicles to the cost of the operation of a crossover, you'll find that you're saving money over a five-year period, not even to mention a longer period if you were into doing that. So I, yeah. I think this is a fantastic thing for EVs. Yeah, and that model, they're calling it an EUV, which is an electric utility vehicle. That's just a, a term they've invented, but it's really an SUV or a CUV, a, a crossover perhaps. Yes. Uh <laughs> Brian, it's time for a very exciting segment that we don't do very often on the show. Elon Musk cray or slay. This is where Elon does something weird and <laughs> I ask you, is he crazy or does he know what he's doing? He's putting boosters 
on the uh, Roadster, the high-end uh, sports car they're coming out with next year or the year after, uh, rocket boosters with air compression um, that you would fill the back seat with this big air compressor. And <laughs> he says it can hover. Is he crazy or does he know what he's doing? Uh, no, he knows what he's doing. I mean, I, it remains to be seen if the hovering will actually ever become available. But I think the main point would be to make this like sort of a track version of the car. So this may not even be street legal. This may not even be a car that you can drive on actual roads. But for people with money who uh, like to drive fast cars and like to go to the track, they can get this uh, rocket booster package. I'm pretty sure they're going to actually have this available. And the main function would be, I believe, to uh, aid in acceleration. And they've already said that the Roadster will go, uh, you know, zero to 101.9 seconds. So these rocket boosters should bring it down to, nobody has said yet, but uh, a, a, a second, less than a second. And also the potential for cornering as well. You can have boosters that point uh, sideways. So much like you know, when they're controlling these rockets on descent, they have these little booster rockets that, psh, 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 that you know, push it side to side and, and reorient it. So you could have those that would also improve. But he said on Joe Rogan, it's going to hover. He said on Joe Rogan, it's going to hover. Is he crazy? Uh, oh, yeah, he's crazy. But that doesn't mean it's not going <laughs> to <Okay>. hover. <laughs> Well, that, that's that then. Uh, Brian, I, I have a carbon bubble report before me um, that has talked about fossil fuel reliant countries and how they will see a drop of their um, revenue. Like they're, they're dependent. These are countries that are more dependent on fossil fuels than even Canada. Um, and they are going to see a 51% drop in government oil and gas revenues and a shift to a low carbon economy over the next two years. Uh, decades. Uh, I found this kind of interesting. Like, uh, according to this, these countries, uh, these petrol states, these vulnerable petrol states, will be um, more susceptible to the $13 trillion drop in revenues than even Canada. Iraq is number one. 89% of its revenues come from gas. So say what you want about Canada, say what you want about Saskatchewan and Alberta. That's pretty significant. Uh, Equatorial Guinea is number two. Uh, South Sudan, Oman, Oman, is it Oman or Oman or Oman? Oman. Libya, Oman, their royal revenues are going to drop because 76% of their revenue comes from oil. God help them. Libya, Bahrain, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, uh, Azerbaijan, and Angola uh, are the top 10. And they range from 56% of uh, revenues come from oil and gas for Angola to 89%. For Iraq, so Iraq is uh, screwed now. Mind you, they may still sell more oil than other places when it's cheaper. So, now, do you know which country produces the most oil, the most quantity of oil? No, I can tell you, it's the United States of America. Really? Yeah, this has only uh, been in the top spot since uh, the past six years. U.S. is number one. Saudi Arabia is number two. I always assumed that Saudi Arabia was number one. Uh, but they're number two, Russia's number three, and Canada uh, coming up at number four, uh, China number five. So, uh, yeah, the U.S. really expanded their oil production with, uh, you know, the fracking of the last several years. But, uh, yeah, I really had no idea, but they are actually in the number one spot. Now, of course, their economy is still diversified, and they've got lots of other things going on, so they're not going to be as affected as some of those uh, countries you just mentioned. Okay, yes. So that's probably also means they don't need pipelines from Canada as much. Yeah, because they're making more of their own oil, absolutely. Uh, okay. Well, I want to thank everyone again for um, making um, um, reviews for us on Apple Podcasts. Uh, that's uh, been very handy to us, and uh, uh, we've realized that people started doing that and taking the time. And it's even better if you leave a, a review. So I'm going to read you a review every week, Brian. I'm going to read you a review, Okay. So our first one is by Professor Lightbulb on uh, February 11. He says, the podcast is very well done, very informative. The sound quality is wonderful. Keep up the wonderful work, James and Brian. That's fantastic. Thank you for noticing the sound quality. We strive here at the Clean Energy Show to give you the finest finest audio quality available to podcasts. There's nothing I hate more than a podcast with terrible sound quality. I mean, you got one job. It's a podcast. It's audio. Make it sound. Do you know what I I hate now during the pandemic is, uh, uh, you know, like Mark Maron and people like that will interview people over Skype and they're really interesting guests, but they're like on a 
on a like an earphone microphone or something like that and it's echoing they're in an echo chamber yeah. room and uh that's just terrible. No, it's, I was listening yes. to the Michael J. Fox interview on Mark Marin, and I actually had to stop listening because the sound quality got worse and worse. Uh, it, it was terrible. If you are a celebrity or influencer or somebody that has something to say, a professor that goes on uh, TV or gets asked for interviews, buy a freaking podcast microphone and find an appropriate room. Put some effort into it, people. Come on. Uh, yeah, so we're going to read a review every week, and uh, so if you want to go there and leave us a review, we will read it on the show. Uh, that is the Clean Energy Show on Apple Podcasts. Brian, what else do you have for us this week? Um, just one last thing. Uh, Shell Oil put out a report where they admitted that oil production peaked in 2019. So this is coming from the belly of the beast, Shell Oil, admitting that uh, we are past the peak production for oil. That's significant because I keep hearing other things. I keep hearing politicians uh, quoting articles that say that, you know, um, we'll, we'll use a lot of oil for the next uh, 50 years. And that's not true. I mean, we, we, you and I who drive electric vehicles know why that's not true. Um, Jason Kenney, I pointed this out on uh, Twitter the other day. He was in September 24 said that uh, he said something disparaging about India and hello, India. Uh, we have some listeners in India. Uh, he said that people in India are not going to be burning cow dung for their energy needs. As they claw their way into the middle class, the uh, hundreds of millions of people there will not be driving Teslas. Well, guess who's opening a uh, a manufacturing business in India? Uh, Tesla is. That's news this week, right? Yeah, that would be Tesla. And it's not clear yet what form that's going to take. A lot of people have been speculating it might be more energy than cars because there's a huge, obviously, potential energy market in India and they've got a very sunny climate. So they're perfectly set up for uh, that type of a uh, uh, energy venture, solar and batteries. So the government there, uh, although I, I don't know if I can say anything oppressive and not get banned in India, let's just say they're not... Not 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 well liked around the world as as far as uh, uh, by the way I watched White Tiger on uh, Netflix the other night very nice movie yeah it's on my list of things to watch it's a it's a bit you know it's 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 a movie it's not it's one of those movies you wish was a true story but it's not yeah no Modi wants a clean air he wants he doesn't want political unrest the air is obviously very dirty in India people have seen what uh, air can do in the pandemic it can be cleaner. Uh, they've seen what the possibilities are. So, yeah, and th there there are, like we talked about last week, there's $5,000 electric cars coming out of China that will be $3,000 in a few years, a few short years, maybe even two years. Uh, if they start manufacturing those in India, that makes a difference. And electric mopeds uh, makes a big difference, believe it or not, because the, the mopeds actually are like lawnmowers. They... Uh, they put out a lot of pollution and and various things like that. So even if you're not buying luxury cars, which not everybody will, I can't, uh, then there are still markets. Plus, Tesla is coming out with a $25,000 car uh, designed and made in China. Maybe they'll design and make one in India one day, too. Who knows? The Clean Energy Show lightning round. The lightning round, of course, is where I push headline after headline to clean up the leftover nuggets of news. Uh, at Brian for his brief comment, he is the right to pass. Uh, if he stalls, though, he gets the buzzer. But Brian, Ford announced a major push into electric vehicles in Europe, vowing to convert its entire passenger car lineup to electric on the continent by 2030. So 2035 made waves with GM overall, while they're saying just electric cars for Europe starting in 2030. That is breaking news. That just is hot off the press. Yeah, well, just another target, another deadline. Um, we get these every week now. It's. Um, I think it's a big deal. I think it's a big deal. So, uh, yeah, I don't. I didn't like what you had to say there. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Uh, Tesla uh, introduces a new center console in the Model Y. Did you see that? What do you think? Yeah, it's probably an improvement. The interior of the Tesla cars has never been particularly great, so it's nice to see that they're. Uh, you know, yeah, it sounds like they're making them a bit better, a little bit up, more upscale. That's great. At the current rate, within a decade, EVs will be marketably cheaper to purchase up front within the decade. Marketably cheaper, not parity, cheaper. 
noticeably cheaper, and half the total price to own and operate. That is within the decade. Half the total price to own and operate within the decade. And within 20 years, if trends hold, Brian, a 200-mile four-seater uh, EV with awesome acceleration and modern amenities will be cheaper than the cheapest cars sold in the U.S. today, which are $14,000. So you can get an awesome car cheaper than even the dinky little $14,000 car, which will be crap by comparison. Yeah, we're getting close. We're just uh, a couple of years away, but like, you know, that five grand reduction in the Bolt that we talked about uh, earlier, it's, it's slower than I would like, but it's starting to happen. The Kilowatts is reporting, and you can follow them on, him on Twitter, intelligent range in the Mustang Mach-E is more accurately predicting how much range drivers have using past driving behavior of the vehicle, which everyone else does, but also weather forecasts, uh, which Tesla does if you are um, navigating a trip um, through their Tesla navigation, right? But also crowdsourced data from other Mustang Mach-E owners to give a yeah, this is a huge deal because electric cars never give you the right range. It's kind of frustrating because uh, it's so many variables, more so than gas cars, that your range goes around. And if you are struggling with range, then you want to know how much you have. And you generally don't want to let yeah, it get too uh, low, Yeah, temperature right? and wind. I mean, I'm not sure how much Tesla integrates weather data, but, um, you know, you got to do your own calculations, uh, especially if it's a windy cold day you can't you can't ever trust uh you know the car computer so yeah it makes sense like you know that if the data is out there from different users and and they can pool the data and make the uh, predicting more accurate it makes sense that they're going to do that and i you know someday everybody will guess what we have another story like this like the ones we were talking about jaguar pledges to be all electric by 2025 2025 jaguar Goodbye, combustion vehicles for Jaguar starting in four years, which is basically now. Land Rover will follow by 2030. Eh, less impressive. Yeah, if you read the announcement, it's not as clear cut as that. The the headlines always come out as, I don't know, they left some wiggle room in their, their statement. I, I would not be too surprised if it's not 100% electric by uh, 2025. But it is a smaller company with not that many models. So, you know, it should be fairly easy for them to do that. Tesla China is offering free trials of enhanced autopilot. My question to you is, will people go for it? Because you have that yourself. Do you think that'll they'll sell some software? They will, for sure. It sounds like the, the take rate for that kind of stuff, like the full self-driving package in China has been apparently quite low, very few uh, customers taken, and of course it is very expensive too, but um, yeah, this is this is a way that they can do some marketing and advertising without spending money on marketing and advertising, which uh, Tesla doesn't uh, generally do. Brian, we're running out of time. I'm going to have to ask you to be quick. Uh, electric bus by Hyundai burns to the ground in South Korea. What is it about Hyundai and fires, Brian? Yeah, they're still working on those battery fire issues. Um, it's, a, you know, LG Chem batteries, but no one's quite sure if it's LG or Hyundai. Um, but, uh, you know, it still, as far as I know, fires at a much less rate than uh, gasoline-powered cars. But it's, uh, you know, it's definitely, if nothing else, a huge perception issue that they've got to get a hold of. We keep getting 2020 stats about Britain and their uh, clean energy uh, uses. Here's one. Solar and wind met 30% of Britain's electricity needs in 2020. Pandemic helped with that. But it's an increase of almost 26% year over year, which is pretty significant rate of uh, increasing your uh, uh, green energy mix. Yeah, and I think, um, you know, it's just obviously we keep hearing the stats, you know, clean sources of energy are the the biggest thing that's being installed in the next little while. And I think that there was another Tony Seba story that maybe we'll talk about next week. He's uh, put out another video um, of uh, solar, wind and batteries. That's his pitch. That's going to be the uh, energy generation of the future. But yeah, we should maybe talk about that next week. Brian, let's talk about it this week, okay? Let's squeeze it in, okay? I have a clip. Okay. The basic 100% SWV, you get all of this additional superpower that can essentially power every single mile of transportation if every car, a vehicle in California were electric for free. Did I say free? If you invest in another 20% increase in, in superpower, 
then you can cover today's electricity demand plus transportation, electric, plus residential heat, plus commercial heat, plus some industrial heat. So what he's saying, Brian, is that uh, batteries, solar and wind will become so cheap by 2030 that you'll be able to have systems that combine all three of those things to meet 100% of your grid's needs, okay? So you're just using that. But in order to meet that need, you have to make that, uh, have the output for your worst case scenario, okay? Now, in Saskatchewan, it's going to be different than what it is in, say, California. In California, um, basically 96% of the time, you, you need that extra grid for like 4% of the time. So if you meet the basic minimum uh, requirements for the worst case scenario, the biggest load that you need, the calmest day and the cloudiest day with high demand, then you're going to have all this extra electricity, which you can give away. And it has massive disruptive qualities to it. Do you understand this concept? I do. Yeah. And, you know, the cost of solar and wind and batteries has dropped, well, by varying degrees, but, you know, something like 80% for solar, the cost has gone down 80% in the last 10 years. And they're expecting it to go down a further 80% in the next 10 years. So that's why all of this makes sense when these costs, like they're already a reasonable price, but, uh, you know, this solar, wind, and battery platform that he's talking about, it can be 100% of your grid. And, uh, you know, it, it's just going to be the cheapest and best option because you end up with extra power. Because like you say, you've got to overbuild it. So uh, most of the time, you'll just have excess power that you can just give away. That'll be amazing. Brian, this has been almost as long as a Elon Musk podcast with, uh, what's his name? I mean, come on. <laughs> this is, uh, we've gone the longest ever. Anyway, I want to thank everyone. You can find the Tony Sebia video by searching it on YouTube. Uh, Rethink X is his uh uh, organization and something we'll be talking about more and more in the months to come. So we'll see you again next week on the Clean Energy Show. Yeah, see you next week. <laughs>